While we get Richard wired up and get his program on the computer, I'll just say a little bit about Richard. He is a marine ecologist and director and co-founder of Ocean Life Education. So Richard is one of these people that makes a living out of coming along and talking and educating people and inspiring people about our wonderful oceans. So yeah. it is Two, particularly uh, fantastic that he's come along and donated his time today for us for free. So uh, Richard and Tracy, his wife, is here with him today. They've lived on the Sunshine Coast for over 30 years and have got three school-aged children, all sharing the love of animals and the natural environment. So that's really important. And what Ocean Life Education is all about is to make a difference. And they were rewarded for their uh, business back in 2015 when they won the Sunshine Coast Business Award for Education and Training, which is a real testament to the wonderful staff that helped uh, Richard and Tracy to you know, make this fantastic and effective educational resource for us here on the Sunshine Coast. So please mm -hmm. make Richard feel welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for, uh, for having us here today. Uh, when I say us, I mean Tracy, myself, and of course Oce us representing Ocean Life Education. Um, love to thank um, the ladies, Di and Liz, for having us as well. Um, what you do here is amazing. Uh, if there was more of this sort of thing happening with our, uh, with our public and, uh, and our younger generations, then we probably wouldn't see the problems that we have with our environment that we have today. So unfortunately, you are a small number, but we'd like to see that grow uh, exponentially and have thousands of people at these sort of things across the country, and then we wouldn't have the problems with the environment that we're facing today. All right, so basically I don't want to be lecturing too much about what we need to do, although there is a lot of human impact that we wanted, I want to discuss with you in relation, thank you very much Liz, uh, with sharks in particular and the and way people view sharks, the bad media they've had about them and just what we're doing, why the sharks are important and of course why of course they, they attack humans in the first place. So we're going to go through a, few, a, bit of the, a, a fair bit of that today. But I can't help but go past what we've just seen up on the screen before because I am a scientist background and I have to mention a couple of those things that we were talking about just because I can't let it go. <laughs> All right, so the first one about with your, your runoff. There's a, a few questions about the runoff and the kin kin and, and, and the um, sedation or sediment that comes off the land. When we clear land for crops uh, and or for building, and uh, you get rain events and you get wash off of the topsoil that comes down, that's true. Just farming the land will loosen topsoil as well, that comes down. And so sediment is basically all that fine material that washes down into the river and then washes into the river systems. Now it doesn't just stop there. Okay, that's, that's, where, we, that's where we need to, to go a little bit further. Uh, the rivers run out into the sea. And then out into the sea, close to the land, we often have areas like seagrass beds and also coral reef. Now you may have heard of uh, our problems that we're having up in North Queensland trying to stop coal uh, ports up there at Abbott Point and for, that is one of the major reasons is because of the moving and of, the, of the land and clearing to make all that happen is going to release a lot of sediment uh, and as well as the traffic from the ships up there is going to destroy those areas up there. Luckily we've had a downturn in mining industry in some respects because that means that there's probably a less demand for coal so there's probably been a bit of a stay on that development up in North Queensland which is a good thing for the environment because the seagrass beds and the, uh, and the coral reef areas are huge, huge uh, nature reserves for, and nurseries for animals that live in the sea. 75% of all the animals that we eat from the sea have a direct link to seagrass or coral reef environments because that's their nursery. So we really need to protect them. So that's taking that step of that sediment in the, and turbidity. Turbidity is the word we were looking for before uh, when they're doing testing on riverways and waterways. The turbidity is the amount of, or the lack of clarity or the amount of particulate matter that is in the water. And that can actually drop out and that becomes sediment. All right, so that's, that's how that works in a scientific sense. The other one with your bees. All right, now I'm normally marine based, but the bees, the color, now can someone tell me why, why the, color, the flowers are colored the way they are? We know they are colored, we know that bees can see certain colors, but why? Does any, can anyone help me there? Have you got any animal lovers or insect or boars or insect lovers, no? No, the colors are there to attract the bees. We know it's to attract the bees, but why do the flowers want the bees attracted to them? To pollinate. 
to pollinate. Yeah. So they're attracted by that so they can come in, they brush up, they can change and the pollens that are on from another plant can swap over and that's why possibly your trees aren't getting any fruit because you're not getting pollen from another tree to fertilise and make your, uh, your real fruit trees fertile. Well, there you go. That's not getting that fertiliser. Yeah, well they're not being fertilised by or having that pollen brought to them by bees. Okay, so they're not, they're not fruiting up for you, that's why. Yes? Um, they can too, some butterflies can. Um, and just with the sharks, we've come through spring. Everyone knows that spring is the time for action. Okay, so there's a lot of babies being, uh, being produced and, and, and being born at the moment. And sharks are one of those things. So, and also the stingrays that you mentioned up in Lake Wyber. And the reason they're in Lake Wyber, and I'll go on with some, one of the other sharks we want to talk about today, is because that shallow water is safer for them to have their offspring. When they're in shallow water, there's less predators in the shallow, shallow water. That's why they come there to have their babies. So everything is the way it is for a reason. That's the point I wanted to make. Everything is the way it is for a reason. And that's what we try and educate children, adults, everyone that we take our, uh, our displays to, that everything, no matter how strange or how weird it might seem, everything is the way it is for a reason. And science is about that, is understanding these reasons why. Um, and that's what we want to do today with uh, having a look about, the sh talking about the sharks. So that is us imprinting on the Everest Australian. We've been through that, so thank you uh, for doing all that for, <laughs> for me, Di. Okay, my background, we won't labour on it because uh, Di's already been there, but I did actually do my degree in uh, marine ecology at the Griffith University at Nathan Campus in Brisbane. Um, and then from there we went to, or well, we worked at Underwater World for 11 and a half years while that was still an Australian owned company. Uh, it's currently now owned by the English. The, uh, by a company called Merlin International and it's now longer underwater world, it's actually called Sea Life. Uh, but very, very many good years there. Public aquariums are very necessary for educating the public, the general public about wildlife. There is this fight between zoos and aquariums from your nature lovers and your, and, your peop and your people that run them that are just making money from them. I sit right in the middle of those as, an, as, a, as a scientist and an environmentalist because while there are companies that are making money for people coming through the door to see that sort of stuff, it is also very important, as Di said before, if we understand it and we know about it and we learn about it, we will want to appreciate it and we will look after it. So having aquariums and zoos is very, very important for that very reason. So we need them to be there to educate the public so we are more aware, so we want to look after it. So that's what I believe is, is very important about zoos, parks and aquariums like that. All right, so Underwater World was great fun. And then, uh, then we left there and I actually went and did a great dip of education at the, uh, the University of Sunshine Coast. Um, not because I wanted to be a classroom school teacher, but because I wanted the credentials to be able to say, oh, I've got the qualifications to actually take this around to schools and to places like this and actually educate people about them. So it was more of a qualification than anything else. We've been running Ocean Life Education on the coast here for 11 years. I've lived on the Sunshine Coast for 36 years with my family. And, um, We've, I guess it's same we've, as me. We've been, we've, I can't believe I don't know you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we've been here for a long, long time. Uh, not that long, but um, and have seen a lot of changes over the years. Uh, I used to fish off the rock walls at Malula Bar as a, as a boy and used to catch lots of fish, tailor and mackerel and tuna off that rock wall. You'd be lucky if you could get a brim or a flathead off that rock wall now. And why? It's because of the, uh, the amount of... Uh, building and uh, population growth along the coast and the rivers that are letting sediments and, and uh, chemicals out through the river. The Maroochee River and the Malula River has a lot more uh, things flowing into it compared to the Noosa River. So that's making a difference to the ecology of the, uh, and the close-in reef systems that are there, unfortunately. Although, having said that, you can still go for a dive on the, uh, the Nearing Reef and the HMAS Brisbane and there's very beautiful animals and it's pristine still. But what we need to do is, is to make sure we look after it so our kids in the future and your grandchildren get to see that as well. All right, beliefs, educate early, breed ownership and responsibility. That's what we are all about. Teaching them early, get them aware and so that they can fix the problems that we've created. Now, the generation, the general, slightly older generation, I'm not being rude, in this room here, you get it. Uh, the young children that we take our, and our animals around today, they get it. It's our generation that have stuffed things up. Okay, and the slight, and, and, and the next one up from me. We're the ones that have just, and, and I blame you 
because you made it easy on your daughters and your sons. Now, like my parents, you came from, a, from, from the hard days when, thing, when life was tough. You've come out of depression, you came after wars, and you didn't want your children to go through those hard times, so you made it easy on them. And because you made it easy on them, they've become complacent, and we don't care enough for what we have. And that's why we are the way we are today in our mindset. So we need to change that. Okay? Do we need to make it such a problem that things and animals are being pushed to extinction and we have climate change raising water levels for us to, to bother doing anything about it? Let's hope we can figure it out before, that, before everything's gone. All right, can be a little bit bleak, my message, but, uh, but we need to be aware. So I do blame the older generation for making it too easy for our generation, okay? Because we haven't appreciated it. All right, ambition. Teach adults, and we've already been through that one. All right, this is what we want to talk about today. No, not the Port Jackson shark, but sharks in general. Has anyone seen a Port Jackson shark before? Okay. Sharks are the way they are they, for a reason. Not all sharks have different teeth structures because they eat different foods. Okay. Sharks don't eat people. We'll explain that a little bit later. But this particular shark only grows to one and a half metres long. Now, just to give you an idea, I'm going to use this table here today for measurement because it's always nice to know how things are long without going like this. Basically, this is one and a half metres long because I've measured the distance between my two hands fully stretched out. So that's one and a half metres, almost the length of that table. Not quite. That's how big this guy gets. Now, we don't see actual Port Jackson sharks up this end of, in Queensland. They are found more in New South Wales near, where do you think they're found? Near Port Jackson, yes, which is where they get the name from. The Port Jackson shark is a crested horn shark. There are many different types of crested horn sharks. The name crested horn shark comes from the sea above his eye. They have this crest, this ridge or a crest, and then they have in front of the dorsal fin. I don't have a pointer, so I'll use this one. Oh, a pointer? Oh, I do have a pointer. Oh, I'm liking this. In between the arrows? Oh. You shouldn't have shown me that. I'm going to have fun with this. All right. This one here, see that little horn there? That's a little pre-dorsal spine, so that's where they get the name crested horn shark from. The Port Jackson is just one of those species. See that there? That's the egg that he came out of. That is a spiral shaped egg. Inside that egg, it's perfectly ovular, it's oval inside. Okay? The reason that it is that shape is because they live amongst rocks and sand and when, they, when their eggs are laid they'll actually use the mouth, they grab it at the top there and they'll swim around and they actually drill it and spiral it down and so it digs into, in amongst the rocks and the cracks and crevices so it, doesn't, uh, so it can stay there and be safe while the baby is developing inside. Alright, so that's why that egg is shaped that way. Why do some sharks have eggs and some do not? It's a lot, it's a lot, to, it's a lot to do with the size. Some have, well, sharks come into the world in three different ways. I'll get to that in a minute. Three different ways. Yeah, you, don't think on that too much at the moment. You'll never get past it. All right. So, one and a half metres long is how big this guy gets. Mum's not big enough to carry a lot of young inside her to, get to, full, to, to be fully developed and then born live. So what do they do? They lay eggs. Much the same with most animals. If they don't, aren't the size to carry young around lots of them, then they have eggs, produce lots more eggs, 40 to 60 eggs in a breeding season. When is breeding season? Over the summer months. As we're seeing now, we're finding stingrays being born. So in the summer months is when they're being born. So this guy here, okay, the females will have 30 to 40 probably with this, this smaller sort of shark. And they hatch out of that egg and they're usually no bigger than about, what's that, about 10, 12 centimetres long. Okay, and normally they have the camouflage patterns on them because they're vulnerable to predation. So that's why some sharks have eggs. They encrypt to give a higher fecundity, which means a higher number of offspring, so that their species survival is enhanced. All right. Other sharks, like the larger sharks, like we're going to get to, have live young. And then there's one more, which we'll explain. Now, over this way, on this table, and you're welcome at the very end to come up and have a close look at these, although I would say please be careful of your fingers, not with this one, but all the others that are on the table, because they are extremely sharp. This here is the jaw and the teeth of a Port Jackson shark. They don't have sharp teeth. They have little teeth at the front that are for digging out crabs and shellfish and mussels and oysters from amongst the rocks. That's what they eat, because that's where they live, near the bottom of the ocean. They have crushing teeth. Can you touch those for me? 
Just those ones in there. Just there. Oh, no, that didn't hurt. <laughs> that didn't hurt, did it? No. No, but it's just like it's just like a rock. Okay, so they're used for crushing and eating animals with hard bodies. That's what their teeth are for. Are they dangerous to humans? No. no. Unless you're working at Melbourne Aquarium for 18 months and you're doing a feed and you're looking at something else while you're feeding a Port Jackson shark and it happens to bite you on the fingers. And it's like having your finger hit with a hammer. Oh. That's how strong their teeth and jaws are. Very powerful, very solid. This looks like bone, but it's cartilage. Like what's in the end of your nose, okay? That's cartilage, what's in your ears, that's cartilage and what I used to have in my knees, that was cartilage. <laughs> all right, so these guys here, hard-bodied animals, okay? That's all they eat. So. That's the Port Jackson shark, not very big, lovely little animal. But then we get to the next one. This one here, looks a bit meaner, doesn't it? Yeah. Look at those teeth. Don't they look really mean and nasty and shouldn't we kill it because it's gonna eat humans? No, no, just like the gray nurse shark, the lemon shark has extremely sharp teeth, but they're very, very narrow. Just like the gray nurse shark, which you saw in my picture that we had up there before. Okay, their teeth are made and designed for catching and catching and eating small school fish. Small to medium. Probably, let's use my hands again, probably about no bigger than that, maximum. Alright? I can feel a dad joke coming on. Are you ready? Alright. See, he's got these very narrow teeth, very sharp, very pointy. He wouldn't eat anything much bigger than that or very large or very hard because that would break all his teeth and that would be pointless, wouldn't it? All right, now he may just break a few of those teeth trying to eat a medium sized fish, but it doesn't worry sharks like this because they have lots of them. Okay, there are rows and rows and rows of teeth, a shark like this, and as I said up the back there, I won't walk down because I'll mess up Jim's photo, uh, filming, but you can come and have a look later on. Lots of rows of teeth. Sharks like this, and the, this guy here goes to three metres long. Let's go back to my table. One, two, three. Okay, so that's how long from the edge of the table to here. That's how long these guys get. Three metres. So they've got a lot of teeth. They're going to live for a long time, but not as long as we first thought. Okay? We thought sharks with that many teeth would live for hundreds of years, but they lose their teeth on a regular basis. They'll lose seven or eight teeth every 12, 13 days because they slowly roll forward and they drop out, whether they're broken or not. Their gum is such that it, that it rots away and pulls away at the front and then the teeth from behind will, like a conveyor belt, conveyor belt, slowly roll forward and drop out. And then one of those teeth from behind will slowly roll forward and take its place. That way they've always got a good strong set of sharp teeth ready to eat their next meal. And what was his favourite food again? Fish. Small to medium fish. Did they eat us? No, there's been two recorded instances of lemon sharks that have actually attacked humans. One was a man in, uh, fell, jumped out of a boat and fell on one and it bit him. Fair enough. Okay. The other one was a, uh, in a, an aquarium where a bloke was harassing one and he got bitten on the backside and he deserved it. All right. But it wasn't a malicious, I'm going to eat that human. Yes. Yes, lemon sharks do eat stingrays. They're found in quite often in shallow areas in shallow water. If you've been, anyone been to Heron Island? Okay, they actually have some lemon, resident lemon sharks which come up into the, up on the top of the atoll at high tide. Really cool, really, and harmless. Go and swim next to them. Don't go grabbing them, just go and have a look at them. All right, because if you grab them, they think that you're trying to, trying to attack them. All right, the next one. Ah, now. Let's talk about whaler sharks. This is a sandbar whaler, okay? The, the whole group of sharks called whaler sharks spawns from a long time ago here in Australia. We used to hunt whales. Anyone been to Tangaluma Resort on Morton Island? That was an old whaling station, okay? So not that long ago, we used to hunt whales here in Australia. They would harpoon the whales, they'd be bringing them alongside the, the boat, there'd be blood in the water. These group of sharks would come up and they have very, very sharp teeth triangular shaped, serrated edges. So they'd bite onto the side of the whale, shake their head from side to side and saw off big chunks of whale meat. That's where the name whaler shark came from. Okay, we, and we otherwise, um, well we'll talk about another whaler in a minute because he's notorious. This guy here, very sharp teeth, dangerous to humans? Not really, however, they do hunt by vibration. The cousin of this one is the more dangerous. 
and that's the bull whaler. Okay, I don't, actually I do have a picture of him. But before we get to that, let me talk about him a little bit more. So large fish can even attack whales, big animals. Can be dangerous to us, but would be rare. Okay, lots of teeth, as I said with the other one, this is only a small whaler too. This one would be lucky if it was one and a half metres. Okay, now the sandbar shark, because, or sandbar whaler, see the height of that dorsal fin and the length of those pectoral fins? They're a lot bigger and lo uh, longer than what a normal shark would be. The other whaler sharks have got shorter dorsal and pectoral fins. Can anyone suggest why that might be? No? Because, as the name suggests, they live in shallow water near where waves are crashing. So they have the extra long fins to be able to give them better balance where there's more turbulent water. Does that make sense? Everything is the way it is for a reason. Okay, so these guys, they'll come in packs and they'll hunt school fish in close to shore or where there are waves. So that's why they are designed the way they are. Everything is the way it is for a reason. All right, beautiful shark. The only shark that I've actually been bitten by when I was working in underwater world, on the thumb. That's another story, I'll talk about that a bit later. Just intriguing you with that little snippet, yes. So you said that the former one, the teeth revolve further. Yep, all these sharks now do. So how did they, how long do they live, you Oh yeah, sorry. We did believe that they, believe, they lived to hundreds of years. Now, we believe between 60 and 100 years max. And that's probably more so for the bigger of the, of the carnivorous sharks. Okay, so thank you for drawing me back to that. But yeah, 60 to 100 years for the bigger sharks. Not very long, is it? And they've also found out there was once upon a time we believed sharks didn't get cancer. Not true, they have found cancers in sharks. Okay, whether that's because of the pollution that, and then what we're creating to their environment, that's another story. All right, and for more science to figure that one out. This is the guy that I believe is our most dangerous shark of all. Okay? Not because he wants to be mean and nasty to humans, because sharks don't understand what humans are. What we need to get through to the head of people, and because they read media reports and they, they, they see movies like Jaws, very wrong opinion about what sharks are all about. This guy here is a bull whaler or a bull shark or black river whaler or if you're from South Africa, it's a Zambezi shark, okay? All the same species, all the same, all the same type of animal. So we get these in the Noosa River? We get these in the Noosa River. And you don't just get a few of them, there are hundreds of them in the Noosa River. All right, and you swim in there all the time and have you been bitten by one? No, thank you, point taken. All right. <laughs> Sharks don't want to eat humans, okay? We're not on their diet, they don't understand what we are. But they make mistakes, all right? These guys, now, as nice as the Noosa River is and the Maroochee River and all those other rivers, even a lot worse, the Brisbane River, where there are lots of them, and the Narang River, and the Albert River, they're everywhere in all our river systems because that's where they spend most of the time looking for food and hunting, but it's also where they go and have their babies, their pups. Remember how we said that the stingrays come up into the shallow water? These guys will come up into near brackish to fresh water to have their babies. Reason being, there is almost zero predators eating their babies up in that type of water. They've made themselves resilient to it and over the years evolved to be able to go up there to have their babies so that their offspring are going to be safe. That's why they do that. Everything is the way it is for a reason. When they did the uh, development at Twin Waters down the coast, and they built the weir there, and they made all the canals. They netted that out when they built that weir to get whatever was in there, any nasties out. 600 whaler, bull whaler sharks they got out of there. 600 pups, so little ones. Uh, that is a very good question. I don't have that information. I'd, I'd like to say, think that they just let them go out to sea, but I probably didn't. All right. Um, hunt by vibration. As I was talking to you before, most rivers and canals and estuaries where they've found the water isn't that clear, is it? Look at the Brisbane River, dark and murky, can't see. So how do they find their food? They feel for their food around them. Sharks are very, very sensitive animals. They cry at sad movies. No, they don't do that, that's silly. <laughs> but they do have an amazing organ in their snout and it's got a very strange name. It's called an ampullae of Lorenzini. Can we all say ampullae of Lorenzini? Let's get some action happening. It sounds like something off an Italian restaurant menu, doesn't it? But ampullae, if you've done anything to do with science, it'd be like a very small vial, a very small, small container. Lorenzini, well, he was more than likely the person that actually discovered this organ in the shark. 
in the snouts of all sharks, no matter how which shark it is, all sharks have in their snouts lots of big pores around in their skin. That's your ampule, is the pore. Okay, inside the pore there is a blob of jelly, and in each blob of jelly there are thousands of nerve endings which run straight from there, straight to their brain. That enables them to pick up the slightest vibration of an animal in the water. So vibration and movement is their number one way of finding food, their key of finding food. Not smell, not even sight, vibration, movement. Okay, that's how they find their prey more, than, more times than not. Some sharks, having said that, have got excellent eyesight and can see colour, contrary to what past belief was. Okay, more science and more research has found out that some sharks see colour perfectly well. Yes? Any different from those two bronze whalers? Bronze whalers are a cousin to those. The bronze and the dusky whaler are very similar. They are not as thick through the body. They're a bit more slender, but they are equally uh, aggressive because they hunt school fish. If you've been anywhere near Fraser Island and, and gone fishing for the tailor, you'll see them up there ramming the, the, the schools of fish near the beaches trying to get at them because they're running into the shallows because it's easier to get them there where it's shallow water. Okay, so bull whaler, again, hunts by vibration. Now if you're splashing around in the water in a dark murky uh, river, they can't see, they come up and check you out. And what do they check you out with? This isn't a bull whaler, this is the sand bar whaler, but it is, a bull whaler is much, actually, I won't get to that one, bigger, broader teeth than this one. Okay, they check you out with those, that's gonna do damage, isn't it? Okay, we're talking about putting nets on the beach down in northern New South Wales. Absolute, we're going backwards as a human race, even faster than I thought. Okay, nets don't do anything to help secure beaches. They do not, they do not, they do not. Okay, let me just get that totally clear for you because a net will be out the front of the beach, won't it? Yes. This is assuming that sharks are swimming straight in to a beach to have a go at whatever's splashing around. Sure, there's people there splashing and making vibration. We don't see lots of shark attacks even still though, do we? Even in the beaches that don't have nets there. Okay, but it's assuming sharks are, straight, are swimming, let me put him down, swimming straight into a beach where the swimmers are. Sharks don't hunt like that, they hunt by swimming into a current because where's their food coming? Down the current, because that's where they're swimming from. That, so they'll ambush food swimming up into a current. Does a current run straight into a beach? No. You stand at the beach, you feel it sweeping one way or the other. So when I was at Underwater World working and we knew the people that cleared the shark nets along the Sunshine Coast, 75% of the sharks that were caught in those nets were caught from the inside going back out again. So what's happened is the sharks have come in, they've heard this ruckus because that's a big vibration, way too much noise, not, not, not food. They've turned and gone out to get away and they've gone and got themselves trapped in the nets. So that's a waste of life. Not only that, but we, what else do we get caught in? Turtles and whales, okay? So waste of time having nets. If we want to do something, in it, and you can, it's all right just to say that, but if we don't have something to, to fix it or put up a solution, then there's pointless me even saying that. I think the solution is we have the technology now to detect large animals moving through the water. So you have at the end of each of a, a stretch of beach some floats with some little sensory devices on there. If something large is swimming in there, it lets out an alarm and everyone gets out of the water. Not real difficult, okay? Simple, nothing gets killed everyone nice and happy and safe. As we said before, there are lots of whalers in our waters. Has anyone been killed in the Noosa or bitten in the Noosa River? Has anyone been bitten in the Maruchi River? No. One bloke surfing out the front of Maruchi River got bitten on the foot by a wobby gong. Okay, let's leave that there. Bull whalers, dangerous to us, close to where we are, okay, and because they're often in murky water. Ballina, when we had the guys that died down there a couple of years ago. Now, if we look back and we look at all the, all the rainfall data, the Richmond River is, runs out to the south of Ballina. Okay, there'd been a lot of rainfall. That river had been flushing out into the coast. Where were those blokes bitten? Right where that water flushes out along that beach. Water was dark and murky. They, sharks couldn't see. They're big whalers in there. Three metres to three and a half metres worth of whaler shark. Okay, so about here to the end of the table. Solid big shark, lots of big teeth. That's what's happened to those blokes. They weren't great white sharks on those occasions. They were actually bull whalers. Yep.
Next one. Notorious. Actually, probably the most gentle shark that I've ever come across. And calculating. They think. You can, see, you can just see their thinking. I've actually fed a 12 foot and a 9 foot one of these in the underwater world by hand, but we stopped getting them in the tank. We stopped bringing them in because they didn't last very long being in captivity. They don't like being in one spot too long. They're a nomadic shark. They move in and out of warm and cold currents quite regularly. Okay, So being in a tank where it's fairly uh, singular temperature for most of the time, they don't like it. And after about 6 to 12 months, they start to list and their tails drop and they fall to the bottom. So we used to have to try and get them out before that happened and let them go and release them. Uh, unfortunately, we'd had a couple of die. We stopped getting them. We stopped getting tiger sharks. Okay? Some animals you just can't keep in captivity, so you've just got to be aware of it and, and do the right thing by the animals. All right, his teeth. Very, very different. Can you see the point of their teeth is bent round to the side? Otherwise known as a coxcomb, you know, on the top of the... Yep, yeah. well it's that shape for a reason, because guess what his favourite food is? Turtles. turtles. Sea turtles, to be more correct. Now, turtles have got really hard shells, don't they? So, as like all the other sharks, lots of spare teeth. They are a lot more solid than most shark teeth, and because that, bit, that point is bent round to the side, and powerful jaws, that enables them to crack down on the shell of a turtle, cracking it, and then with the serrated edges like a steak knife, shake their head from side to side, sawing off a big chunk of turtle meat and shell. So you might think, well, he's going to swallow the meat and the shell? Yep, because that goes down inside his stomach. He's got powerful digestive juices, but it cannot dissolve all that shell. Okay, calcium carbonate and keratin protein. That's what the shell is. All right, can't, can't fully digest it. So what does it do once it's had enough and the food's gone out of it and he can't, doesn't think that there's any, any, it ejects its stomach out through its mouth and releases the contents of its stomach. <laughs> and then drag, handy, and then drags, drags its stomach back inside its body again. That's what they can do. They have found a way to adapt to eat the foods that are around them. Pretty amazing, very amazing when you consider the shark's mouth isn't always like this wide open, okay? It can swim around with its mouth like that and still eject its stomach out and not pinch it or pierce it or cut it doing what it's doing. That is pretty amazing, all right? Tiger shark, dangerous to us, yes but in a given environment, okay? Bull whalers, rivers, canals, estuaries, all sharks going swimming too early in the morning, too late at night. Most of them are nocturnal feeders. And the, and the same rule applies. When it's dark and murky or they can't see because it's night time, they hunt by vibration. These guys here could be the middle of the day. You're on a boogie board or a surfboard with your arms over the front and your legs over the back. What does he think you look like? A turtle. He thinks you look like a turtle. Goes to five metres long. One, two, three, four, five. That's a tiger shark. This is the jaw and the teeth of a two metre tiger shark. If I was to hold the jaw and the teeth of a five metre tiger shark over my head, I'd also be able to pass it over my shoulders. They eat big animals. That's what makes them dangerous to us. Do they want to eat us? No. They don't understand what we are. We don't live where they live, but we go out into their environment. You're on a boogie board or a surfboard. You might look like something they eat. They might make a mistake. There's your other reason. First of all, vibration. Second, mistaken identity. All right, mistaken identity. They don't want to eat us. Luckily, sharks don't like the taste of humans. Found that out firsthand. <laughs> How did you feed some humans? First hand, first, and I, and I, and that was a very good pun I've just used. I don't want to, I don't want to let that go. First, first hand, because yes, I had my right hand bitten by one of these um, when I was working at underwater well. This is to prove the point that they don't, they aren't excited by human blood. Okay, feeding one of these, a bigger one of these, three meter female. She was a big one. Went into a feed at underwater well. I don't know if any of you have seen those feeds. Can be quite hectic. Back in the day when we had lots of really good sharks in there, big sharks in there, jumped in the water and this big female, she's come in, she's dropped a pectoral fin, she's turned suddenly and I could see, you just knew that she wanted to have food. She was hungry. So we've gone down to the box, grabbed the biggest tailor out of that box that I could. Now I don't know if any of you fishermen have known anything about tailor, but you freeze a tailor and thaw it out again, what happens? It goes mushy. So I've picked up this monstrous big fish and it's gone and dripped over the back of my hand. 
she's about a metre and a half away from me and I'm going, oh crap, what will I do? <laughs> have, to, have to think reasonably quickly, swung the hand that way, we're wearing wetsuit gloves, so I'll be alright. Swearing, swinging the hand out that way and then before I knew it, because she was quicker than I was, her mouth was over the fish and my hand. I was just extremely lucky. You can have a close look later, it's a bit hard to see in this light. I've got a scar that runs down my thumb. She bit through the fish and, and, and my glove grabbed it and gone like this, like that with her jaw, so she's gone like that and just and it felt like a hot paper cut. That's what it felt like, a sharp, just a sharp burn. And then I've gone, ooh, wonder how bad that is and there's a little green trickle comes out of my, out of my glove because blood looks green underwater. And then I'll, mm. so I clenched the thumb, held it really tight and did the rest of the feed without not one shark bothering me at all. Not one. They are not, and it's since been proven in science in the laboratories that sharks do not react positively to human blood. It's been proven. Okay? And to make the point even further, a young gentleman two years ago got uh, bitten both his legs off by one of these and bled to death by the time he got to shore. Lost both legs. Big tiger shark. He was 200 metres from shore in New South Wales in a place called The Well. They call it the well because it's very shallow a long way out and then it drops very deep. Just where predators like this are looking and searching up and down looking for food, like turtles. He's on a boogie board. You can't look any more like a turtle than that. And in that sort of water, not, not good. The shark came up, bit both his legs off. Now he was there with friends. They got him back to the shore, all that blood in the water. Not one shark, not even that shark came back and had another go. They don't like the taste of blood. Thank goodness, if they did, we'd have a lot more shark attacks. So why, I guess what I'm saying is, do we need to kill sharks? Because we, we have this thing, humans have this thing, we try and change the environment to make it safer for us. We try and change it to suit ourselves. It's the, it's the worst problem we've made as, as the human species. Instead of us altering the environment, we needed to adapt to the environment around us and understand what it is that's sustaining us because in the end, it won't sustain us any longer and we'll be gone, pure and simple. Heavy message, but there's the facts. All right. Ah, uh, yes. Yes, and I'm glad you brought that up. I'd, I'd love to go and do this, to go and cage dive with these guys. I'd love to do it because they're an amazing animal, an absolutely beautiful animal, but the fact that they go out in the boats and they burly up the water to bring them in is not a good thing because it's, it's making the sharks think that every time a boat comes out, that's going to happen. And if they don't do it, if someone goes out there to have a nice day on the sea and then all of a sudden there's no burly around, they're going to come up and nudge the boat and go, hey, where's, my, where's the food? Exactly. Calling card. Bad message, wrong message, and that's why, people, that's why people are having more and more instances where they're coming up to their boats. Not good. Great white shark. Carcaridon carcaris, the largest of the carnivorous sharks. This is a small jaw from only a two metre great white shark. Yeah, you know how we said the tiger shark was a big one? Well, these are six metres fully grown. One, two, three, four. I'm out the wall. I'm over at the wall. Much bigger, okay? They eat big foods, of course, to sustain their size. They like to eat foods like seals, big animals. They'll attack the whales. Do we all see the whales coming up last season? Yes. And then they go back. Guess what was following them all the way up and all the way back? These guys. Quite often you'll hear at the time of year when the whale season's on, you'll hear sightings of great white sharks. Why? Because they eat the afterbirth and they also try and eat the calves. The afterbirth is rich in iron and protein. Perfect food, on hors d'oeuvres for these guys. And then if that's not enough, well, they'll try and separate the calves from the mums and try and have a go at them too. So a lot of the behaviour, the slapping and the, and the breaching to get these guys out of the way. Okay? Not to say that they do that all the time. Not all the time that you see them breaching and tail slapping are they doing it to get rid of a shark. Sometimes they do it because they're just frolicking, they're having a good time. Yep. And or they're teaching their, their babies. Okay? We think we know everything but there's so much more we don't know. And my guess is that there's a lot of that is, is, is them teaching the babies. And I do this you get this side of me, or whatever, however they talk to each other, which they do by making sound through the water. Okay, amazing. So these guys, big teeth, very, that's, like I said, that's a two metre great white shark. And yet, have a look at the, the size and the width of those teeth. So is that gonna make damage to us? Absolutely it is. You go dressing in a black wetsuit and you've got your fins on, what do you look like to him? Seal. You look like a seal. 
Everyone remembers this, the footage from Mick Fanning, the surfer over in Jeffreys Bay in South Africa last year? Okay, that's the other reason why sharks will have a go at humans. It's because everything in the water to these top predators is possibly food. And so anything in the water that they're not really sure of, if you watch that footage, that shark didn't roar up to him and have a go. He's just cruised in there just nicely. And he's like, whoa, what's that? Oh, I'm not really sure. Let's go and try it out. And what do they try out with? They use their teeth. Luckily for Mr. Fanning, what happened was when he got just before he got to his board, the leg rope of his surfboard, which is attached to his leg and to the board, went through the shark's mouth. And it, the shark, if you watch that footage over and over again, had already started turning by the time it got to the board because it was spooked. So he didn't know, oh, what's this in my mouth? Turned to go away, but because it was stuck in his mouth, shark's gone down, knocked him off his board. He's banging the shark, shark's taking off. Shark takes off out to sea, drags him under the water because it's still attached to his leg, the, the leg rope. Until the teeth cut through the leg rope, shark goes that way, fanning goes that way, okay? The rescue team go and get Julian Wilson and, and Mick Fanning out of the water and take him to the beach. But they forgot the cameraman, who was 50 metres out and had to get back to the beach all on his own. And apparently he was a real mess by the time he got back to the beach. Let's, let's hope he was wearing his brown speedos that day. <laughs> all right. Not very nice. Because even though that shark had long gone, and they're not to know that, and this is because our knowledge and our thought and our perception of sharks is so wrong with Jaws, the movie Jaws. Hands up if you've seen the movie Jaws. Okay, most of us probably have seen it. Peter Benchley, the author of the book Jaws, has actually gone, gone all around the world trying to help prevent um, the killing of great white sharks. He's helped trying to save them because he realised what damage that story had done with people's perception on sharks. Okay, because it's the biggest and the most meanest. It's got the big teeth. They look mean and nasty, yes, because they only are made for eating foods that are in their environment. Okay, so very sad that that's happened. They, that book and that story would have you believe that they would smash their noses through boats to get to people. Yeah, you've all seen it. Okay, what did we just say they had in their snouts before? The ampoule of Lorenzini. No shark is ever, ever going to do that. What do they do? They come up to the boats and they just mouth it with their teeth to see if it's food or not. That's what they do. And that's the other reason why sharks attack humans. Okay, because you're all just mouthing something gently to see if it's food. When it's gentle, it ain't that gentle when you've got something that looks like that. That's going to do damage, isn't it? All right? Sharks don't want to eat humans. They make mistakes. Yes? So is there a correlation between the time of day when attacks have occurred? Absolutely. And There's... colours of suits? That have to okay. Yeah, well, we did say, yep, absolutely. Colours with the higher end sharks, like the great white, they can see colour. Um, there's always been the, the, the thought about the black and white stripes because of the sea snakes that are venomous and they wouldn't go in and that means danger to them. Nah, there's been some sort of not enough information or research done to get enough data to say, yep, that's what we're wearing. Um, same with red. Red to all animals means danger or warning. Okay, but does that mean the same to a great white shark that everything else in the ocean to eat is possibly food? There's only one other animal in the ocean that the great white shark may fear. Does anyone know what that is? The top predator in the ocean. Jim? Thank you very much. Good man. You've learned a lot from these shows and since you've been doing these, haven't you? All right. Killer whales. Killer whales are the number one predator in the ocean. However, there are shark great whites that have attacked killer whales and vice versa. So they're almost the, the two top sharing apex predator in the ocean. Okay. So do sharks need, mean to eat humans? Sharks don't eat humans. They don't like the taste of humans. They don't smash through boats to eat humans like jaws. Um, and they don't attack smelling our blood. They can detect a drop of human blood in a 50 metre swimming pool of water. Does that mean that excites them to want to attack us? No. Sharks do hunt by vibration movement. They hunt mostly nocturnally. Your, your question about the evening, I think over here, sorry, at night time, they are nocturnal feeders, predominantly early morning, late in the afternoon. Okay? So, that's when most sharks are feeding. Why? Because it's, they're ambush predators. Their, their prey can't see them as well. Because they have that ability to hunt via vibration, makes sense. That's the best time to want to, to look for food. Okay? Um, check things out with their teeth. We've mentioned that. Mistake humans for food, seals, turtles. Okay? They have an important role to play in the ecosystem. Sorry, ladies, I'm in your way. I'll try not to say. They eat, they eat dead, sick, or injured animals out of the sea. Okay, so they're cleaning up that side of things. Not only that, 
Oh, well, well, remember when we had whales dying and they said, no, nah, leave them out there because the sharks will eat them. Smart. Instead of getting it out there, oh, no, no, we can't have that. No, leave them out there and let the, let the whales and, and all the, sh uh, the, the sharks, the whalers and the, and the whites have their time and the tigers with that, with that carcass because that's normal. Okay? Um, They're eating them. What a waste of human. Well, it is. Well, not entirely because then that will go into the sand and all the little animals that are in the sand will eat it as well. But it's a natural thing for them to be doing that, so we let nature, nature take its course. Let's not interfere anymore. Let's stop interfering because that's what we do as humans. We have a nasty habit of doing that. All right. In the ecology side of things, the animals that they normally eat, the turtles, the whales, the seals, all those big fish that these big sharks would normally eat, if we took and we made the sharks extinct, then all the numbers and the populations of those animals that they would normally be eat would increase. And then what happens then? All the animals that they need to eat, well, there's more of their population they need to eat, kind of like what we're doing as humans on the planet. Keep populating, we eat, there's not enough to sustain us, Everything's gonna, they'll die. The whole crash of the whole ecosystem. Okay, we as humans, does anyone remember Nostradamus? Yes. Yeah. The younger generations probably haven't heard it so much. Nostradamus, he, he, he actually predicted, he was the big predictor of things. But we are very naive. What we have failed to see, he predicted that there would be a plague on this planet that would probably end the planet. And do you know what that plague is? It's us. We are the plague. We populate exponentially, fill up this immigration, people going from other countries because their countries are full, and we'll just keep doing this until there's not enough food to sustain us, then what happens? If we haven't already destroyed the atmosphere because of our carbon pollution. All right, let's not be too nasty and, and, and finish on a bad note. We've got to finish on a happy note. What's a happy, ah, oh. let's finish on a happy note. Has anyone seen one of these? Yes. All right, now these are a lovely animal. The sawfish, and I have great pains to tell kids not swordfish. Sword means that it's just one big long spike. Um, and swordfish like swordfish and marlin and sailfish, they use them for one main reason. Does anyone know why? What would they use that big long spike for? Chop. Chopping up, yeah, maybe chopping up, but mostly to herd the schools of fish and the bait fish into a tight ball so then they can swim through it and get at the food. So it's to get them together to herd into that, that school, into a tight school so they can eat it. Similar with this guy, saw. Saw, because there's lots of little teeth on it like a saw. Okay, sawfish, okay. What do you suppose he's got that for? Is that to get rid of all these people that want to eat him? Well, not so much stab that way, but to whack, yes, that way, yep, to thrash through schools of fish, because guess where his mouth is? Underneath his body. That's on the front of his head, that big gonzo there, and then his mouth's under here. Now, he likes to eat fish. Now, that's pretty ordinary. When you're going to eat a fish and you're going to swim after a fish with that in the water and try and get a fish with that, out, no. So what that is, he swims through the school of fish and they thrash it through violently through a school of fish. It maims, kills or disables those fish. They drop to the bottom then swims down over the top of them where the mouth's underneath and eats them off the bottom. That's what the primary use of that is for. Okay? Secondary use, they can sit on the bottom. They can sit still on the bottom. Some sharks, like those, no, actually, he's a little different. He can vent, I'll explain that. That one and that one, they never stop moving. They need water flowing through their mouth because they have a high metabolism. They burn up their oxygen a lot faster than most other sharks. So they need a constant flow of oxygen over their gill, through their gills. So they never stop moving. So your next question is, how do they sleep? Thank you. You're sharp. You are. Ooh. <laughs> All right. How do they go to sleep? They shut one and a half of their brain down, of course. And then they keep swimming. And then they, when they, want, they shut the other half down and wait that one and a half. And they do what Dory said in Finding Nemo. If you've seen it, they just keep swimming. Okay, they never stop. But these guys here and some of the small sharks, like the Port Jackson shark that we mentioned um, and the bamboo shark that we often take around to schools, they have little holes. And the, the uh, stingrays. You look on the top of the stingray, you see those big holes that are opening and closing all the time next to their eyes? Yeah, they're called spiracles. So that enables them to sit on the sand and they suck water through those. The water goes inside their bodies over their gills. They get the oxygen out of the water. Then the water with that oxygen goes out their gill slits. That's how sharks and fish breathe. So he's able to sit on the bottom, just minding his own business after he's had a good feed. And Mr. Tiger Shark comes along and he goes, because they'll eat just about anything. And he says, oh, opportunistic feeder. Oh, they'll have a go at this bloke. And then he doesn't want to be eaten. So what happens? Whack. He cops that. 
So it is secondary use, it's to protect himself from being preyed upon. Absolutely, northern, up in the northern areas particularly. Um, microdons, I forget the first name of their species and genus and species name, but microdons, they, and, but they are becoming less and less. Why? Because of illegal netting. You can imagine an animal like that would very easily get caught in a, in a net, and that's a problem. Okay, but as we said at the outset, no matter how weird or strange, everything is the way it is for a reason. Yes, sir? Can be, yes, can be found in fresh water, just like with the, uh, the sharks, like the bull whalers. When I was at Underwater World, we actually kept, we kept these guys in fresh water in the Billabong area there. She's really big. We called her Makita. She had a really big saw. Um, I used to hand feed her, but not directly with my hand, because that would be really silly. We'd feed her on a big long stick and stick a fish on the end, and she'd whack, whack, whack the stick, almost like in the natural thing, and the fish would drop off, and then she'd go down and eat it off the bottom. Yeah. The only problem with doing that when I was working Underwater World, have you ever been there and seen a really big barramundi? Yeah, so you've, you're feeding and you're concentrating on feeding this animal here and you've got three or four fish because we'd breath hold. We wouldn't go on and scoop because it's not that deep. You'd breath hold and you hold your hand with the fish in this hand and you're feeding with that hand and all of a sudden your, your, your mouth is halfway into the, up to the throat of a uh, barramundi, big femur, because she wants the food. And you, it's, it's a bit frightening when you do it the first couple of times, then you get used to it. All right, everything is, everything is the way it is for a reason. Let me bring you to this one. We mentioned these guys that are out in, the, uh, in Lake Wyber. That is the barb of a stingray. Actually, that's a barb of a big stingray, the blotched fantail stingray, the Taniiri Myeni. Okay, looks mean and nasty, but it's only ever made for self-defence. Because what's the number one predator of stingrays? Sharks and big fish like groper. Yep. I meant to ask before, Richard. Yes. You mentioned about stingrays and sharks. Yep. Well, there's a few of them. The lemon sharks do. Well, the, are they immune to the venom in these stingrays? Oh, I'm glad you brought that venom question up. Contrary to some of the misinformation that came out when Steve Irwin unfortunately died with one of these, they don't actually have a venom associated with it. What it is, they have a skin covering over there and they have a mucus covering and in that they have what this stuff called a zoonotic bacteria which is in there, not a venom, okay? Now, in the case of Steve Irwin or anyone that, gets, that w is unfortunate enough to have one of these punches, that will leave a nasty wound and it will be infected very easily because of that zoonotic bacteria which is within it, okay? Now, for, let me go back a section and I'll tell you and we'll, we'll ex try and explain Steve Irwin's situation. All right, first of all, that sits on a stingray my hand is the stingray, my arm is the tail, okay? On some stingrays, this, the barb will sit one third down from the base of where the tail meets, uh, meets the body, okay? So it sits about there. On other stingrays, it's one third up from the very tip of the tail, okay? Now, different stingrays, different areas, different swimming abilities or areas where they swim is probably why they are in the two different spots. Okay, now the blotch fantail stingray, his is fairly up, up fairly high, but they actually are able to move and they can twist their body around. We used to breed these big ones at Underwater World, big, big, over 100 kilos worth. Okay, and that's where I got that from because we had one thrashing around when we were moving around and, and that came out and stuck into the net. All right, so that's where that came from. And so they're sitting on the sand, minding their own business. They bury themselves mostly in the sand and that's why their eyes and their, their spiracles are up slightly higher than the rest of their body so they can sit covered by the sand but still be able to breathe and see. Number one predator comes along but we mentioned they've got a very good way of finding them. They've got that ability with that snout, that ampullae of Lorenzini. They can pick up the heartbeat of that stingray under the water if they're swimming close enough. Okay, so what happens is they come down, they're looking, searching for food. Oh, there's a stingray down there. Comes down to try and eat the stingray. Stingray sees that. Up goes the tail. When the tail comes up, the barb comes forward. So whatever is trying to attack it is jabbed into that predator, that would-be predator. Ouch! Predator then forgets about eating the stingray because it's got this horrible, nasty pain and then takes off. Quite often you'll see um, pictures of sharks, when they're, especially with the, with the, even with the grey nurses, where they've got, they're swimming around with barbs stuck in them because they've had a go at stingrays. Yeah. Do, so, they, do they ultimately die mostly from the... No, not from the zoonotic bacteria, no. With the sharks, it'll, it'll be stuck in there, painful enough to stop that shark from eating it so he can take off and get away, but not, not to kill it, because you've seen them with them still stuck in there and you wonder how long that's been stuck in there. 
Okay, so purely a defence mechanism. With Steve Irwin, and what I tell kids, no one really knows. Only the people that were there really knows what happened. But all I can say and be guessing is he used to get up very close to animals to film them. He was doing a, a, a filming footage for Bindi's show. And he was in shallow water. You're swimming over the top. What does your silhouette look like as a shadow over the top of a stingray? It looks like that of a shark. Stingrays panicked, up goes, and he was very, very unlucky. He got that where he got it. Now, because of that bacteria, and because it went through his left ventricle, he was never going to survive that. He was going to have a long, nasty, painful death, I reckon. So what he probably did was, was the best thing to not make that nasty and painful. He grabbed the pliers and pulled it out. Mm. So not very nice. Not very nice. Yes? Can they be quite accurate with their bars when they put their... Well, if you, if you imagine them sitting, because it's central to their body, especially if there's attack from above, and the first move, it's up like that, you would think, yes, it would be fairly accurate. But when we were moving them around in nets, then they're, they're flipping that tail everywhere, and it's, it's going everywhere. So it's a, it's a dangerous thing, and they're very, very fast. can be very quick. Um, for people going out in the lake, Wyber, and having us shuffle your feet. I mean, as a kid, we used to walk around, not that I'd do it anymore, um, we used to walk around from the canals on dusk, uh, moving, swimming and walking around from canal to canal in Mooloolaba and you'd have these things, and they'd go out from underneath you. They're more likely to take off than want to do that because they're not, they don't know what we are, we're standing on them with a foot, it's like they'll take off. Every now and again you might hear someone that, that accidentally gets hit by one. Okay, there's probably more instances when the horses down in Brisbane, they used to take them down into, around Nudgee and there into the water there, getting stung by these in the shallow waters there and getting them into their legs, yeah. There's probably more cases of that than anything else, yep. Yep. Their eyes are virtually expressionless, grey or green looking, but there's yep. some sharks, like that tiger shark, yep. and yep. have large eyes that look like they have a lot of expression. Absolutely. Again, probably to do when, when and where they're feeding. The grey nurses are a, are a, are a feeder in those small shark with the sharp teeth, small little beady eyes. They sense, they can see, but they'll see schools of fish and they'll snap through into schools of fish. He likes to be able to see and, and they ambush prey. They're counter shaded, dark colours from the top, light underneath. So you can imagine a turtle, he's cruising underneath and he sees that up there. He needs to have good eyesight to be able to see it and then up he comes. Same with the great white sharks. Because of the way they hunt uh, and the size of the animal, they have a bigger eye which is a lot more capable of seeing colour as well. Whereas the nurses, they don't think they can see the colours that these guys and the whites can see. Possibly. What we, what, we do, what we do is anthropomorphise. Have you ever heard of that terminology before? Yeah, so we're giving animals human traits. So, and often that's a problem we have. Jim. Quick question for you. Yes. So the larger sharks have a nictating membrane which slides across and protects their eyes. Yes. Do the smaller sharks you aren't, like the carnivorous ones who are likely to get attacked, is that? All carnivorous sharks that, that will, will have them will have that, but with the, the whites there's actually two membranes which come across. Um, and because they're eating foods like seals with claws, okay, so they could cop it, so that's to protect their eyeball, yeah. Not to be, can people confuse them and think that, they're, that, that their eyelids, they don't have eyelids, it's just a membrane which is a purely a protection, protection from um, while they're praying, yeah, absolutely. Yep? I've heard that there's a nursery for grey nurse shark, I don't know where they've got that name of the brain. Yep. Yep, Wolf Rock. Yep, absolutely. One of them, um, Flat Rock, down off um, Stratty as well. Um, and then you've got Southwest Rocks. Okay, now what the thing is, the, the, the big thing that we and still haven't found out is sometimes you'll see the schools of, of uh, sharks and it'll only be the males or the females. Very rarely do you see them when they're together. So they, they'll move in different packs and then where they go to breed is, yeah, they still haven't found that out. Mind you, when I was at Underwater World, we did successfully breed about four or five babies, uh, pups in, in captivity. Um, and it's very torrid. The, the shark, the, the female has two uh, extra layer of thicker skin because when they mate, they bite hold of the female to hold on so they can mate. 
Yeah, it's it's and when you got those teeth, they just we come in on on the morning after they've been they've been mating at night time and they are just a mess. There's bite marks and blood all over them, and they'd be haggard like they're almost droop like that because they're just that worn out. Well, you know, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, but uh, and we used to all, yeah, of course, made all sorts of fun of and jokes about that as well. But um, I've actually played a my, my wife is a midwife by her uh, her profession, but I actually got to be a midwife for a um, for a grey nurse shark because we had one in there. I don't know if you remember, she had a slightly bit of scoliosis in her spine. We called her bent spine, and and she was pregnant. She had a pup. And we always knew that well, this could cause issues when she was ready to have her pup. And, um, and it did. One morning we'd come in and there's this tail half hanging out and we didn't know how long she'd been getting around like that. So we thought, well, we need to get in there and get that pup out of her. Because of that bent spine, she didn't have the muscular ability to be able to push that shark out of her cloaca. So, um, so I jumped in there and got one hand on her. I had to do this reasonably quickly, mind you, because you don't want to upset the shark. Um, and then just and pulled it out and the, boat, the pup lived. Yeah, so luckily for us. So it hadn't lost the oxygen. Before I answer your question, I want to go something before I forget. I mean, I could go on for hours. We've got, we've got, I've got one more thing. Remember I told you before, and no one's pulled me up on it, um, there are three ways which sharks can be born. We said the egg layers and then these guys, the live born like the great whites. That grey nurse we're talking about is the third way. All right, and some of you may have heard this before. They're called oviviviparous. We are viviparous animals. We give birth to live young, vive, Greek or Latin for live, living. Oviparous, what the smaller sharks, over for egg. Ovaries produce eggs, ovaries, over. And then we have oviviviparous, which is what the grey nurse and some sharks like them are. What happens there? After that torrid mating ritual that we mentioned before and the females are fertilised, the females actually have two uterus, not one. And then they have a number of eggs developing in each uterus. And then they hatch while they're still inside mum. And then the strongest one and fittest one goes around eating and killing all its brothers and sisters for food, whether they be hatched or not, and then after 12 months, born alive. So that is the third way which some sharks are born, and that's an oviviviparous shark. Oviviviparous. After 12 months from, from the time that they've hatched from within. So a two month gestation period for grey nurse sharks, which is why they're critically endangered on the eastern seaboard of Australia. Because humans, as silly as humans have been over the years with anything environmental, people went and hunted them because they saw those big needle, needle thing, nasty teeth and thought they were man eaters. When all they eat is small to medium sized fish. So we nearly pushed them to the point of extinction by hunting them out because they were easy to catch, they were close to where we were. Wolf rock, flat rock, places where they're easy to fish. And we nearly killed them off. Until all of a sudden it was realised, oh hang on a minute, no. We've made a mistake here, kind of like putting cane toads in the cane fields. And, and then we realised because they only, they, have, they only have a two year, digest, um, uh, two year uh, gestation period and they only have two pups per litter, one from each uterus, they, they weren't regenerating as fast as they were being taken out. So we we're pushing towards extinction. Now that any part of the grey nurse that leaves the water on the eastern seaboard of Australia is, is pr fully protected, $80,000 fine or more I think now, um, their numbers, we believe, are slowly coming back. So they are, we haven't actually killed them right off. They don't carry on that cannibalistic tendency after they're born? No, no. Once they're born, that's, that's it. Um, probably because of the size too. Because once they're born, they're about a, just, just on a metre in, in, in size. So again, so they're almost too big and too tough for them to want to eat, so they wouldn't bother doing it. Earlier you touched on, uh, on killer whales. Yep. Mm -hmm. Not in the wild, you don't. Oh. No. But in captivity, they weren't really attacked, they were just dragged down, weren't they? So what's that killer whale telling to people? I don't want to, I don't want to be here. They do, and they'll hunt together. Attack humans, no. no. Mammals, highly intelligent. Okay, but even the sharks are more intelligent than we credit them for. They're calculating, they, they think. Okay, they have a very strange brain, it's in a Y shape. They have like two horns and come up into a central, central plate, very amazing. Question? Richard, uh, there are any number of uh, tales of, from survivors of shark attack 
There is a few, yeah, not just one. There's more than enough. And, and often guys on surfboards, and let's get this clear, the guys that go surfing, I mean, a lot of people go, oh, the bloody idiots, they go surfing and then it's early in the morning or it's late. Well, that's the only time they get to go. Give them a break. But most surfers will say, we know we take a risk, but that's the only time because we've got to work. It's the only time we can get a surf in. So as long as they have that opinion, then no one's going no to get up them or, or, or admonish them. But... Yes, they sorry, what was, get back. The on the nose, yeah, sorry. The yeah, that's what I was, yeah, most of those surfers will say, they've just punched, well, Mick Fanning, yeah. when, he, when he was up, he was punching around the, the nose and head, and why? What did we just say before? Because that's where they're the most sensitive. Eyeballs, there, because that's where all the sensory information is, and, that's, and, and that makes sense because that's what they use for hunting their food. So absolutely. So and there's more than one. Um, but then you get the, the you've got guys like Rodney Fox, yeah. uh, and he was but he was ab diving at the time. I don't, was he ab diving or was he actually spear fishing at the time? I think he was ab, ab diving, and he got bitten. He's got the he's got probably the best ugh, beats that scar by ridiculous. <laughs> Whereas right around his midriff, and the only thing that saved him from being bitten in half was his weight belt. And he's got all that, like the big, great white, just jaw marks on the back and front of his body. But, he, but even he says, and he's been back in the water since, they, they know that they make a mistake. I mean, he was in a black wetsuit, he's getting abs off the floor, scraping noise, that vibration, that sharp vibration that's in the water. Um, and then sharks come in, seeing something that looks like a seal, oh, beauty. And, and, but did it carry on? No. Because if it had carried on and came back and had a real go, he'd be, he wouldn't be here to tell about it. So... What's one here first? Yes. Would you say there are more sharks, particularly great whites, up and down the coast? You see footage on. I reckon. I reckon. Yeah. Look, I think it proportionate to whales and food availability. I reckon there probably is more than what there was. Plus, they're protected, well, just like the grey nurse. Of, of two great whites swimming together. Yep. You never used to Oh. Like the apex predators, solitary yeah, solitary to a point. But then there are times when, they, when you, if you've watched footy seven, there'll be four or five of them come in, and and they sometimes, especially with breeding times of year, they won't be too far away from one another. But then off they go because they don't because they're a big animal, as you say. They need big prey, and they'd rather off go and not have to compete with another animal of a, of a similar size for that food. So that that what what makes that common sense. But there are times when they will be, they, they can be found together. Yeah, um, South Africa, probably the most prominent of those. Yep. There's a new product Sorry, I'll get out the next. called um, Shark Bands, and it's actually got magnets. Yes, it, it's to to, sharks. for that very reason, because yeah. of that, yeah. yeah. And, I, and, and rather than, like I said before, rather than, than having a, a negative impact on any way for the animals to be safe on the beaches, I think we just do something which lets us know they're there and then get out. Because having those, well, remember they, they actually a while back, it was about five or 10 years ago, they tried those, those electronic probes to, to, that sent out a really high frequency to stop, to, to scare sharks off. And while that might've worked, it was also probably damaging other animals like whales. So, so that, they, they, I think they canned that, but they're still looking at that, that sort of technology like your, your shark bands. Um, so individually, yep, pretty good. Um, and, and look, it, it can't hurt. Um, but I think for our beaches, we've got to get rid of the nets. Get rid of the nets. Pointless waste of life and time. Is, are you able to convince um, authorities to get rid of the nets? Well, we, what I would suggest is do it scientifically. Some of the, the, the what I've just mentioned now, but, but grab figures. Grab figures from, from the nets that are cleared and just look at it and go, there's your proof. Most of the animals that are caught in them are going out. Um, and then, and, but the other ridiculous thing they're doing is setting drum lines, baited hooks. You bait a hook, you're going to catch a shark. All right? Duh. There was a 4.72 metre tiger shark, which used to be a fairly known resident tiger, female, used to come and visit Old Woman Island. The surfers all knew about her. Never attacked anybody until it was, and then one uh, last year, year before, it was caught off Majimba Beach, 200 metres from the, from the swimmers, swimming beach at Majimba, on a drum line. And because that shark was over three metres long, they have to kill it because they have no other way to replace it. So they shot that female shark and what died with her, the seven pups that she was carrying. So you've just gone and lost two generations of sharks right there.
just because we think that we've got to change things around us, the environment around us, to suit us and to make it safe for us. We went wrong a long time ago. We cleared land and we built things like this for us to stay in when we should have been living in the trees and things like that. <laughs> that sounds silly and stupid to you now, but when you think about it, what have we done? What have we done? What have we done? Yep. Continuing on with the mending program, yep. you think that the expertise that are around now will be able to get it right? You'd hope so. We well, just, we just spent a week down at Mennix Head, yeah. with the barker down there, yeah. and the effort that they've gone into trying to repair the stuff up that happened. Mm -hmm. um, we could do, because when you're just a common, ordinary thinking person, yeah. you know that's not going to work. Yeah. No, look, I, I think the way technology, I mean, look at televisions, look at your mobile phone. Go back 20 or 30 years ago, do you think everyone here would be walking around with this device that you could talk to mum and dad who's in another state or in another country? No, you would not. So technology is advancing that fast. We should be nigh on, if we aren't already there, creating what I've just said, is, is something that detects between two, two zones on a beach, which can, okay, something large has just come through there. Whether it be a whale or not, just get the people out of the water. You know, are they worried about hysteria? It's more hysterical by having a bloody net out there and, having, and catching and seeing kids see a poor whale caught in it and possibly drown and die. So absolutely, but I'm, like as you said, technology is there and it was, we should be there now and we've got to create it. If it's not, it's, it's shades away. Because as you look at your televisions, every, every month your television that you bought a year ago is outdated because there's something better than it now. So that's how fast technology is, is, is improving. Yes? Uh, two things. Do you think once a whale kills, not kills or bites a person, do you think they keep on, it's a real myth, people say, oh, you've got a real killer whale, and he's either old or he's disabled and ca can't catch other food and things no. are easy and things like that, because that's a great thing that goes around. I, I think Fingal, it's... Fingal, down at the Byron Bay now. Yeah. Sharks. Or... Oh, sharks? Yes. Not, not, not whales. Oh, sorry, I said sharks. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Um, Sharks, they have this thing called, they, which has been brought about from Jaws too, they still use it, there's rogue shark yeah, rubbish. Yeah, that's, what yeah. that's what you're getting at? Yeah. yeah, look, if a shark knows there's food in a particular area, but they, they go all around the world and find food in different spots all around the world. So I, I would dare say that a great white or a tiger shark, it might, they're opportunistic, they come across food in their travels, oh, I'll eat that. They won't just stay there and think that's it, this is all going to stay until it's all gone and eat people if they're all gone. No, 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 no. They no, might no. be a bit old and they might be disabled and this is easy prey. That's yeah. What I'm yeah, I, I, I still don't think. There, there'll be probably definitely, they'll go for something that's more injured, no, more injured and, and dangerous. do that. You get a crow or something, I used to raise baby ducks, hmm. and that crow will come in and eat a baby duck and keep yep. eating that baby duck until. Because they know they're there. Shoots the crow. Yeah. Those days, I'm going back 60 odd years. Yeah. And, and they come in and in. Okay. Yep. And also the saw shark. Mm. Uh, are they different kinds? Because the saw sharks I've got are much thicker, the yep. base, and they and they taper. They or they, taper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that there's one seems pretty yeah. Significant, sort of. Yeah, there's probably about three or four different species. Uh, because I'm talking about the ones up the sea and things like that. Yep. Really yes. Yeah. They're getting really big. Well, that, like I said, that that big Makita, she was nearly three meters, and and her her. Um, but that's. Her, her rostrum is about three or four times the size yeah, of that. Yeah. But yeah, there are three or four different species. Bigger, older sharks, bigger. Yeah, bigger rostrum. It grows with them. 